Hey guys, welcome to a Silicon Valley Girl. Today we have Graham himself. I am so, so yeah. happy. I've been following him for over six months and I've started investing because of you cool. and I'm thinking of getting a house because of you. And nice. this is so cool. I'm working on my YouTube channel. You know, a lot of things that I'm learning from him. That's great. And uh, I'm so happy I can, answer, I can ask you questions. I'm an open book. Uh, yeah, and it was really hard to come up with questions because we were brainstorming and uh, people would just asked me questions about you and I knew all the answers because you post so much on social media. But still, I have a lot. Okay, so cool. first of all, um, you mentioned that you're making from 250 to 350 a month yeah. on YouTube. Can you break this? Yeah, of course. About almost 200 of that is um, YouTube AdSense. Maybe AdSense. sometime even more. I think wow. the main channel, I think it was April or May, was uh, almost 200,000, just, mm -hmm. just the main channel. Second channel, I think, was 35. Podcast, we made a grand. So that's pretty good. Wow. Um, programs were anywhere from like 30 to- Oh, you still count that as YouTube income? Yes. Okay. Yeah, oh yeah. Um, then programs, another 30 to 60. Mm -hmm. uh, sponsors, probably another 10. And affiliates, probably another 40, 50. Wow, affiliates, 40, 50? Yeah, 40, 50, And what are those? What are uh, those? That could be Robinhood, Webull, M1 Finance, any of those. So do you get good good deals with uh, Robinhood? So I only got one stock that was worth like 100, the rest are like $6. Yes, I would say the majority of them are probably mm -hmm. worth anywhere from 8 to $12. But I, I heard somebody got, uh, what was it? Uh, someone got like a Facebook stock, which nice. I was like really happy with. Someone Have you also ever got, got a Facebook Apple. stock? Um, no, I think the most expensive one I got was Alibaba. How much was it? Uh, at the time, I think it was like 180 when nice. I got it. Now it's worth more. So I made nice. some money from that. Yeah. yeah. I think the, the highest one I got was Johnson Johnson's. So okay. 200. So what is other income uh, apart from YouTube? You have your um, real estate, right? Yes. Right now it's actually higher. Uh, I think it's about 17 or 18 thousand um, a month and that's the gross. And then the net on that is probably about eight at this point because I just finished a renovation. Mm -hmm. I ended up renting that out for way higher. It's that, that was actually the unit that you've seen me renovate on my channel. And I think at the beginning, I was like, guys, I might get like 27 for it. I might get 20, just something like that. But I ended up getting 35, just like a few days, nice. which I was shocked for. So that boosted it up. And then I had a vacancy uh, that I just quickly rented out for even more money than the previous tenant. So that boosted up things in the last few months. Why are you still doing it? Because compared to your YouTube income, you yeah. just reinvested your energy back into YouTube. Yeah, uh, all of that's pretty passive at this point. If mm -hmm. I have another vacancy, I'm probably gonna get a property manager, mm -hmm. but those vacancies were so easy for me to work with because I just would have the tenants next door to show mm -hmm. the unit, and then I would do all the vetting process over Did the Did they property. recognize you? No? Um, no, I've actually not been there for the showings. So I have not actually met the new tenants, but I've spoken with them on the phone. So I prefer a little bit more distance at this point. And uh, do you get recognized in the streets? Yeah, we got recognized recently. But um, yeah, I would say it's almost every time I've gone out. Not every time, but maybe like almost every time. How does it feel? Really cool because everyone comes up and shares like a really neat story. Like mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a guy down the street who runs a, a, a business. And we, we were on the scooters just like scooting by and he comes out and says hi and like, he runs the whole business, which is really neat. Nice. Um, so do you edit everything yourself? Yeah, I would say most of it. So the second channel, I have Jack mm -hmm. right now who's editing all the reaction videos and the phone calls. So mm -hmm. he takes care of that. I still do the thumbnails, mm -hmm. uh, titles, description, uh, placing ads in the videos, all that. The main channel, I edit everything. Why don't you delegate it? Because I feel like then you lose the authenticity that I have. Like, I really believe one of the reasons people like my channel so much and that they trust it is that it's just me. It's mm -hmm. not like some big corporation. I don't have a big team. It's really just like me in a room recording videos with like the same camera that I bought used off eBay. I edit on iMovie. Like there's nothing fancy about it. There's no overhead on that. And I believe that's what keeps the channel real. But don't you think you could have had more energy to produce more videos? I know you already have three channels, but yeah. maybe you could have started a show, whatever, uh, with all of that energy that you save on editing. Maybe, but I feel, I just felt like the channel has grown so much to a point where like, why mess with, with something that works? Like it, it works, I got a good schedule down, uh, people like it. So I've like been afraid to pivot too much from that because I just feel like I found the winning combination, like, let me just keep that. Interesting, because I was only able to start my second channel once I started delegating editing, because mm -hmm. otherwise it's yeah. too much time. Well, with your thumbnails, I noticed that you have like one photo that you're reusing over and over. So how many pictures do you have? Oh, well, so, 
sometimes I'll do a custom picture. If I feel like it's something really unique, I'll do something like, you know, I'll take an actual picture for that. But I have found, like I've looked through some of the some of the biggest channels, like David Dobrik, for instance, uses the same few faces in all of his thumbnails. Wow. And there's been a few other channels like that that get like tens of millions of views that use the same reaction and the same facial expressions in the thumbnail. Interesting. And it started for me because I, I think one time where I'm like, I just keep making the same faces over and over and over again and then having to re-edit them. Let me just use one of the old ones. And I used it and it just, it did really well. So I started doing the same thing and like, they've all been doing really well. And no one notices it until you point it out. And they're like, wait a second. I, um, but yeah, no one's really paid attention to it. That's a great And it hack. works just as well. Cause otherwise I'm just, I'm making the same faces. Yeah. So, like I don't have any more faces than that. Yeah. So I just reuse the same things at this point. But sometimes I've been getting more creative with the thumbnails, but uh, it just depends on the video. And uh, with your um, kind of video setup, you film one video in two different locations. Mm -hmm. How does that work technically? So you start here and then you go to your kitchen and then you go back or you just sit and record everything. I have, so I have an outline. Ahead of time, I'll probably plan for like eight hours. I mean, there's a lot of planning that goes into those videos. So there's eight per to 12 video? hours per eight video. Hours per oh, video? Yeah. oh yeah. He's, oh my God. Oh yeah. Wow. No, I am so well researched. Like, because I want to make sure that everything I say is going to be concise so I don't lose people's attention so I don't just ramble mm -hmm. unnecessarily. Because in the beginning what I would do is I'd just have like a topic with a few bullet points and then I'd ramble. And then in editing and spend so much time sitting there being like, what do I cut out? Where do I need this? So now I plan out everything ahead of time. And is I make it sure word by word? Yes. Here's what I do. So I have a whole outline mm -hmm. of usually like, you know, 20 minutes worth of content, let's say and I'll memorize a paragraph at a time and then I'll just recite it back in my own words. So it's never like I'm reading like word for word every single thing, but I'll take the general message of it and then I'll just regurgitate it back to a camera in a way that sounds natural to me. Mm -hmm. So that way I stay on point and I stay like on script so I don't get sidetracked, but I know all the numbers ahead of time and that way it's really concise for the viewer. Wow, so how much time do you spend per day on your YouTube channel? About 12 hours. Uh, so it starts at 6 a.m. Usually ends at 6 p.m. Except for nights like this, like usually one night a week, uh, we do the podcast or something, and I'll go a little bit later. But yeah, usually 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. That's like the set time, and then. Don't you want to have more free time? I love it. Yeah. I love it. Like, like even on my birthday was a perfect example. Um, like Macy was asking, like, what, what do you want to do? But like, I want to work. I'm like, I really, I love wow. it. But that day was, uh, I, I had uh, PewDiePie reacted to one of my videos. And so like I responded to PewDiePie, like that was that was so much fun for me to be able to like film and edit like a PewDiePie video that's now at like 1.8 million views. Mm -hmm. That for me was so much fun. I just, I, I, I love it. Wow. Like that's really what makes me excited. And so what's the end goal with, uh, I mean, making all the money. So you have 6.5 million mm -hmm. right, net worth. Is there an end goal? Is there an end number or is it just a game for you? Like it's fun. I mean, obviously, if I didn't like doing YouTube, I wouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. If I felt like it becomes a chore, I wouldn't do it. Uh, certainly, there are days where I wake up and just don't feel like doing it at all. But and what know, do you do on those days? Just do it. You just do it. Yeah. I can't remember the last time where I didn't feel like making YouTube videos, or I just wasn't in the mood where I just said, you know what, I'm gonna take the day off. I, I can't remember that. But usually, I find that once you get started on something, you'll you'll just figure out a way to make it work. At the end of the day, then I'm like really happy. It's like going to the gym sometimes or something you just don't feel like it, but then as soon as you just show up to the gym, you happen to have a great yeah. workout. Sometimes those are the best workouts. So for me, it's usually like that, but I don't I don't know in the end goal. I just, I really enjoy what I do. So as long as I'm having fun with whatever it is, whether it's YouTube or like maybe doing something else at some point, I'll just keep doing it. That's the best approach. Yeah. Just enjoy the, the process. Mm -hmm. Cool, and uh, so your team is just you and, and Jack. Me That's and Jack. It. Nice. And uh, don't you think that you're missing out on other platforms? Because you are you have Instagram, but you don't post too much and Instagram right, right. just requires you know, daily posting and right. stuff. Do you feel you're missing out? Maybe and maybe not. Like Instagram for me, I have fun with stories. Mm -hmm. So like I would say usually every day, sometimes every other day I'll post a story. If I'm good at it, I'll have multiple stories in a day. So I like doing the Instagram stories because they're easy and they just disappear. So there's no, there's no pressure to post anything good. I stopped using Snapchat because they just I, I didn't really like Snapchat after the new redesign. The new redesign, it's just not like three years ago than whatever redesign. So I stopped using that. TikTok is one of the things that you have like more so inspired me to do TikTok because I'm like, so you I'm missing out. Tomorrow? Yes, I'll start tomorrow. I, I just you have my word on that. You know what, I'll actually start tomorrow. Yeah. yeah, and so once you start all the social media, I think you would need 
to think about optimizing. Probably, yeah. probably. I think the the YouTube channel or YouTube. I don't want to. I don't want to mess with that because I feel like I just. I got a good mix. Mm -hmm. I got a good balance. People like it. It's it's me, and I feel like it just it gives a homey vibe. Mm -hmm. Like despite how big the channel gets, it's still me in front of a camera planning out my own videos on the couch in the morning. I mean, it's it's still the same feeling. And so I've seen some creators too where it just gets too like overproduced and too fancy, especially in business and finance. I think sometimes the more produced it is, the less authentic it seems. And it's just, then it's like, what are they trying to sell me? Mm -hmm. Why is it so fancy? So I've always taken like a really just minimalistic approach, but that's the same thing with my entire life. And it it's works, just like, right? Yeah, it's yeah. the less overhead in mm -hmm. everything. Like even as a real estate agent, it was just me. And I didn't have any fancy like CRM software, like, like anything, it was just, me with like a notepad and just going through and like emailing specific clients all myself. Mm. Nice. So. Yeah, I think some people ask me a question like, what is your secret? I think your secret is just enjoy the process. Yeah, I, I love mm -hmm. YouTube. Yeah. Like I watch YouTube, I love making YouTube videos, I love researching investments, I like reading the news and like figuring out what's going on. I love talking about it, I love explaining that. Um, so if I could take a complicated process and just simplify it in a way that people understand like that's what makes me really happy cool yeah. and apart from youtube what is your favorite activity like how do you have fun what is fun um drums for me is a good outlet mm -hmm. um the gym is a good outlet and uh i would say happy hour sushi what was your most expensive purchase apart from all the houses that you own and, and a tesla the watch, th this watch, mm -hmm. the Zenith El Primero. It? This, it's a Zenith El Primero, but it was the 50th anniversary edition. So they made 50 mm -hmm. in yellow gold, 50 in white, and then- uh, How much was it? Uh, this was 20. Nice, yeah. nice. So this, but it's soon to be an aquarium. I've, I've always loved aquariums, like having a reef tank. To me, this is like a huge purchase, but I'm gonna put a reef tank like mm -hmm. right behind you on this wall. Wow. So, you're gonna, so it's gonna look like a piece of art here, but it's gonna be within the wall and it's probably be about 450 gallons. Yeah. So that's Absolutely. something I really wanna do. Let's talk a little about investing. Cool. What, what is your current portfolio? With uh, index funds, stocks, like what do you have, cash? Cash is, gosh, cash is about 2 million in cash. Too much on cash. savings accounts, CDs? Yes, uh, so it, that's split up between like just high interest savings accounts, uh, California uh, tax-free bonds, treasury bonds, mm -hmm. because the interest in that would be tax-free in California. So that mm -hmm. saves me a little bit on that, just a lot in, in savings. And, and that right now I'm kind of justifying is I want to maybe buy another piece of real estate to use as an office. So like if I find a good deal, that cash goes to real estate. Cash, cash deal or no, 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 no. I mean, most likely that would be probably a fifty percent down payment, mm. and then finance the rest. Why would you finance? Why don't you just pay cash? Because the write-offs. The write-offs. You get first of all, money is so cheap to borrow right now. Mm -hmm. uh, so on this place, I'm getting a two point eight seven five percent interest rate fixed for thirty years, and that's like that's free money because you oh, know, it's fixed for thirty years. Fixed they, for thirty oh. years. That's what I'm saying. It's like so inflation right now is about one percent. Eventually, inflation has to go up at some point. I really believe that it's going to work out to be a free place, uh, or sorry, a free loan with inflation. And it's a write-off. So especially for an office, if I go and buy something like that and fix it up. Uh, Can you, you just, write off the whole thing if it's an office? For an office, what you could do is typically you could depreciate the value of the property. You could write off uh, any expense associated with that. So like interest, mortgage interest, um, uh, insurance, property taxes, anything like that. Or any repairs or upgrades that you make to the property for mm -hmm. business use. Nice. So you just get a lot of write-offs from that. And the rest, you have index funds, right? Uh, the rest, so I have uh, one, I think 1.4 mixed between stocks and index funds. And then- Do you remember what was the proportion? Probably about 700,000 individual stocks, which I have not mentioned to wow. people. That's a lot, by the way. I thought yes. you were the index yeah, fund. Yeah, I yeah. went, maybe a little heavier than I should have in April and May and just like really hard what hit companies. What did you companies. get? What was your best purchase? I think the best in terms of percentage gains was Tesla, believe it or not. And then below that was Boeing. Enphase was a really good one for me, but I bought in. I mean, that was a, just a stupid risky one, but they came out with like a, a bit of a scandal that I was like, this is this is BS. And I put money in Enphase and then it, it's almost doubled since then. So you're gonna keep it or are you gonna sell it? I'm gonna it? get, no, everything I'm just, anything I buy at this point, I'm just gonna be like, I'm just gonna keep it forever. And the rest is uh, Vanguard. Oh, I mean, Vanguard is, uh... 800,000, so you said 1.5 million? No, so Vanguard is less than that, but I'm counting that and another brokerage, Charles Schwab. Okay, okay, got it. And the rest is? Real, is real estate. estate. So what would your investment strategy be if you only had 1,000 today, $1,000 to invest? 
I would probably say education, as like stupid mm. as that is to say, but for a thousand dollars, like even if you double your money in a year and you found something to return, you know, such a high amount, it's 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 a thousand dollars. Yeah, investing. but what yeah. if I want to work on my investing culture? What if I expect to make more next year, but I just want to start investing? Start you know, learning. Buy something. Yeah. I have a feeling your the best investment then would be to use a free stock trading app, no mm -hmm. matter what it is, and learn to buy individual stocks. I think would be the most oh, you, important. Oh, you think it's a better strategy than buying funds? Yeah. For learning. If, oh, if, the, if the goal is to learn how to invest, <laughs> I think, because otherwise, if you're buying a, a, an index fund like that, mm -hmm. what you're really doing is just Buying something super easy where you don't have to think about it and you just let it. You let it still do its kind thing. of mix those funds, right? You have this international fund. You, you could, but I think you'll there. learn a lot more about the markets going and in researching individual stocks, learning to read the reports, and getting really involved in like what makes a company successful and like which ones you believe in. I think you would learn a lot more from that with a thousand dollars. I think a thousand dollars is really just maximizing education. Do you think it's a good time to buy a house? right now? If you find the right deal, which is the issue that I've had lately is I've been trying to find something to buy, but first of all, there's no inventory on the market right now. So anything that comes up is like, Ooh, what's the new property? And people just flock to it. And with really low interest rates, you're getting a whole bunch of people that had money sitting on the sidelines that wanted to do the same thing. So right now, like every property I've looked into has an accepted offer or they're going into multiples and I don't really want to bid in a multiple counter offer situation. So I'm looking but I've not found any sort of good deal at this what, point. What is a good deal? Well, a good deal for me is something that I can fix up. I would say relatively not a ton of work. So I'm talking about maybe something that's cosmetic or doing some sort of like, you know, maybe opening up a floor plan a little bit or doing landscape, paints, kitchens, bathrooms, like something that you could do in like three to five months at the very most. I think that would be, that would be significant for me to be able to do that. Otherwise, I think just something where you could get something slightly below market value. And usually the only way to do that is if the real estate agent screws up their marketing. So if they don't use good pictures, if they don't know exactly what they have, or a lot of times there are things that you don't know until you actually see the property. So it'll list, they'll, they'll be listed as like a three bedroom, but then you go and see it and you're like, wow, it's really more like a three bedroom plus there's two dens that you could enclose and now it's a five bedroom house and now that could be worth way more. So usually it's, it's in listing errors where you can get the best value or listings that were just not marketed properly. Maybe they came on the market too high and they sat and then people forgot about it and then they had to reduce their price afterwards, but now they could be priced really well, but it's an old listing, so what's wrong with it? So a lot of people just overlook this. So do you think end of the year will be better in terms of like for, for buyers? Not necessarily. It's at this point, I, I found good deals in the summer. I've had good deals in the winter. I don't really think it makes sense for the season. Typically what ends up happening is that in the summer, you have a higher likelihood of, of finding the right property because more people tend to list in the spring and summer, but you also have more competition. So you're going in and competing with so, you know, so many other buyers that could potentially drive up the price. Typically in the winter, you have fewer buyers looking and looking to move around the holidays, but you also have fewer listings. So you have fewer places to choose from. So I don't think there's a bad time to buy. I had a question from a follower. So she asks whether she should um, rent a one bedroom and save for a dream house or buy a one bedroom apartment just because she can afford it. But that's not like her dream property. What will you do? Depends how long she's planning to hold on to it for. I think if you're going to keep something for 10, 15 years, it probably makes sense to buy. But I would really look at the opportunity cost of how much money you're going to tie up in the property versus where could you invest that money instead. Oh, and you have and an amazing video on that with all the calculations. Oh, yeah. You remember I, buying versus renting? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's see, a really good one. See, that was a video I spent so long on. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like remembering all the numbers because yeah. you remembered like every single digit. Filming that would take me a few hours and then I'll edit that down at 50 because I, I misspeak so many times and sometimes I'll stutter or I'll mispronounce a word. Sometimes you can just read things and uh, include a B-roll in your video. Oh yeah, so sometimes I do that. So it, it depends every now and then if I have a sentence that I just cannot get right for the life of me and I've spent like five minutes trying to say this stupid <laughs> sentence and I can't do it, I'll just take the lazy, I'll, I'll do that and I'll put B-roll over top mm, of it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, who's your current role model? I would say f two people come to mind first. Dave Ramsey, I would say, is a huge inspiration for me and just what he's done. And Joe Rogan. Mm, I love so you, the two. you want to be like like them? Yeah. Like have more prominent I, guests. I would love to be the combination of a Dave Ramsey combined with fused Joe Rogan, mm -hmm. and just have a personal finance based Joe Rogan esque type show. Nice. I think would be really fun. By the way, Judge Judy. 
of all people,、mm. I respect her so much.、Mm -hmm. I mean, she she just like I love her personality. I love the show. It just just the vibe of everything. She's funny. Like I I like that sort of witty, just no nonsense、uh, approach to things. I really like that a lot. Random Judge Judy, but cool. seriously, cool. Yeah. I think you're on your way with like Joe Rogan, Dave Ramsey.、Mm. That's pretty. One day, not gonna、yeah. win. Yeah. This is real wood, by the way. This is not a veneer. <laughs> real wood. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Do you have a dream car? Um, probably. I mean, if if money were no object and I had a garage for GT 350,、um, I would say maybe another one like a 2001 Lamborghini Diablo 2.0. Like I would love. How much is it? Depends on the mileage. On like anywhere from probably 250 to 350. But it's still、like、less than you make a month. Yeah, but I mean, you you then need to consider like how often am I going to drive that? Let's、mm -hmm. just say, realistically, because I had the Lotus, which to me was like such a fun car. Where is car. it by the way? It wasn't、sold、your it. office. Oh, you I sold, sold it. it.、Oh. Yeah, yeah. Now I got this office, but before I had a garage that I turned into the studio, so I parked that in the garage in the studio, and I rarely drove it. I mean, maybe every few months I'd take it out, but it was just I never drove it. But you had the pleasure、it. of having it. No. I looked at that car every day, and I start adding up. Like, okay, I'm paying this amount of in insurance. Here's the opportunity cost of keeping that money in the car. It's like there's a, there's a whole bunch of things. I was just, I wanted to be done with it. Plus, the new owner loves the car, and I, I follow him on Instagram, and、oh, like、nice. I see pictures of it all the time. But I mean, if I had a garage, and maybe I could justify a cool car like that, just as a background prop. But I just realistically, I care for things too much. Like cars like that. I wouldn't drive it purposely because I want to keep the mileage low, and I would be so careful about like、yeah. the scratch right there,、oh, yeah. and like try to buff it or it gets dust on it, clean it. That's my personality is just really taking good care of things and keeping it clean. So I just would enjoy it. Yeah. yeah. Do Do you want to travel more? Have you been to Europe? No. No.、Uh -uh. Do you, Do you want to go there? At some point. Why not now? You... The, I think the opportunity cost of me taking time off is so high.、Oh. So I look at like the trajectory and the momentum I built up, and just like cutting that to go travel would throw that off. And I feel like I've, I've got the you've got this like momentum, this snowball going for like four years now of continuously. It's just like making videos and working, expanding that. And if I take a break from that, I, I, I want to keep up the same momentum. But don't you think it's endless and life just goes by and you're working and working? Potentially. But you know, I want to do it at some point. But I feel like right now is probably not the best time. You you never get this feeling that you know life passes by and you're working and working. And I love it. No, I, I, I've never I've never felt like I'm missing out. If, if there's something I want to do, I've always done it. Wow. For the most part, I guess that the the feeling that I'd rather make YouTube videos right now is way bigger than the feeling of traveling. That's、right、amazing.、Now. I'm not saying it, it might not <laughs>、yeah. always be like that. At some point, I'm sure I'll just be like you know I want to go do something else, and I will. Wow, it, it just shows how much you love what you do. I really do. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Do you see yourself doing something as an entrepreneur, like starting a company? Yeah, I would want to at some point. I think run my own business of, of some sort, but like I'd run it in the same way of,、uh, as YouTube, just、mm -hmm. something like really simple. There's not a lot of overhead because I just don't like the stress of having to like think、mm -hmm. about so many things or like that's that's one of the aspects I love so much about YouTube is that. There's really no overhead on that.、Mm -hmm. There's very little if it's not like discretionary for that. So I like the no stress approach. Like you, you don't need to make a certain amount every month, or if it all goes to zero, then I'm not like stuck with these big leases or anything like that. So some business that I could run like that, I think would be great. I would love to at some point. Yeah, and but by the way, forgot this question. Do you get hated on YouTube? It's so small. I mean, I do, but it's just. I would say, like, out of a thousand people, there might be one,、mm -hmm. but it's just overwhelmingly positive. But I got more hate in the beginning because people like didn't know you, and so you're coming on the scene, like, telling people how much money you make. That's the point where I got hated on the、oh, most.、Right. I would say it was the first three to four months on YouTube. So after that, it really like any other comment has never seen that bad in comparison because that, that first comment it was just so stingy、mm -hmm. that. It just kind of numbed me after that. But I feel that when your videos go viral, this is what I feel on my channel. When it goes viral,、uh, you get a lot of non-subscribers、mm -hmm. comment, and they would normally hate you. Well,、yeah. uh, do, do you get that? I、or? do, but I find that's the best content because then you could make a response video to it.、Mm. Like when my first credit card video just got like a million views, that was an entire like that was all my not audience. Like like I think at the time when I was, when I made the video, like if I got. A hundred thousand views on a video, like that was 
really good. Like that was a ten, you know, a perfect video. That got a million views in like a week or like five days. So it was all my not audience. What but, was it? Like top? Oh, that was unboxing the JP Morgan uh, Reserve credit mm -hmm. card. But that gave me so much content to make after that because it's like all the comments like, I can't believe you'd get a credit card. That's so much debt, that's so much debt. But now I could respond to those people and make a video uh, purposely be like, guys, I got so many comments saying this, but here's the truth. I like your um, approach, yeah. yeah. So you don't get this feeling anymore that when people tell you you should stop doing this and you're like, oh, maybe I should stop doing I take some comments to heart, mm -hmm. uh, but I think you could tell when they come from like a genuine place. Um, like someone commented recently on the second channel on one of my recent videos with, with this guy Morgs and I read through some of the comments. It didn't seem like people liked that video at all. And a few people had commented on that. Like, listen, I'm not a huge fan. Like, I like the video, I watched them all, but I'm not a fan of this direction that you're going. And then when I see a whole bunch of people like that, I'm like, hmm, that's something to consider. How can we reevaluate? And that was a stupid video. Like, I knew that going in, so it was a bit of a test. Like, this is a terrible video, but let me, let me see if people like it. They didn't. Mm -hmm. So, like, that sort of stuff I take to heart. You know, some other stuff where it's like, you know, Graham, I watch your videos, but lately it's been feeling kind of repetitive. Uh, yeah, so, so I read those, I'm like, okay, that's probably, that's probably true. How can, I, how can I pivot from that? So I take constructive criticism really seriously, but anything like, you suck. Yeah. I just, I mean, obviously it's, there's no point in yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, that's a good approach. Thank yeah. you. What was your record breaking month in terms of revenue? <sighs> probably close to like 500 grand. 500, yeah. was it this year? Uh, yeah, I think that was. With all the stimulus checks? God, maybe April, yeah, I think it was April, but that was, yeah, that was a combination of like, the best month ever on YouTube. Uh, I think I think the channel got like 17 million views, excuse me, 17 million views. Wow. Um, the birthday program sale, that did well over 100,000 on that. And just a combination of just everything. Oh, one so, video, yeah. yeah, 100K. Wow. Oh, there was a pro, I mean, that was a swipe off my Instagram. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was a whole coordinated thing, but wow. yeah. Wow, that's pretty cool. And uh, is there any end goal with like the, the money that you're making? Is there a number? For example, do you have like a goal for 2020 in terms of the money that you're gonna make? No. So you do, do you have any New Year's resolutions? Uh, it was to start the Reef Aquarium. Oh, okay. <laughs> Reef Aquarium and then I think 3 million subscribers was I think my New Year's, but the you're Reef Aquarium close, was a big right? one. Two, two point? Two, two. Two, two. So I got eight, 800,000 and another, Five oh, months. So all together? Yeah, okay. I don't know if I'll hit that one. How but fast is your channel growing? Do you know? It's 100 to 150,000 mm -hmm. subscribers a month. Knock on wood. Because it's it's the algorithm. It's just It just depends on like what gets pushed, like what's trending. Finance was trending like a lot for those two months around the stimulus content. And now it's slowly starting to pick back up because the stimulus is like coming back into the scene. So people are really getting interested in personal finance because of that. Yeah. Which I'm really a fan of. Exactly. It's your you know, topic. From, from that yeah. perspective. Like it's, it's terrible what's, what's happening in the world. But at least people are starting to pay closer attention to how much am I spending how much am I saving? What's the importance of, exactly. uh, of investing? How can I get involved in my community and like, like get a say and maybe have an influence of what's gonna happen with a stimulus check? Or, so I think from that perspective, it's positive. What is your five-year vision? Where do you see yourself? I have no idea because even like five years ago today, like I would, I would have had no idea that I would be here today five years ago. Oh yeah. Uh, like five years ago, if you asked me like where did I, I would be like, oh, I'm gonna be a better real estate agent. I'll sell $40 million a year in real estate. And you know, like that's what I would think. So I would have no idea. I mean, at, at this rate, I would imagine myself being more like a Dave Ramsey, Joe Rogan type thing. And I think the, the podcasting thing is really interesting. I think more of like the, the talk show format is really interesting. I think answering people's questions like on that form, like imagine a financial judge Judy where people go on and you yell at them for being like, like you shame people, like you, you have someone's budget. Like, like imagine like a, like a mom takes her like, you know, 18 year old daughter in and the daughter has a spending problem and the, the mom is there like a, like a Dr. Phil sitting down and be like, you spent, you know, $50 this week on Starbucks. What were you thinking? <laughs> you know, and really just like, just like, you make it funny, obviously. Yeah. You're like, you're not the, yeah, you're that sounds cry. Cool. Yeah, I but like something it. like that, like a Judge Judy, Dr. Phil combined into finance, I think would be really cool. Yeah, that's cool. And yeah. do, do you think you're gonna stay in LA? Uh, that's a good question. I think, yes. Um, it, it's crossed my mind to maybe like Las Vegas, mm -hmm. but part of it is just like, I really like, I like living here. And I think it's just the quality of life. And your family's really here? Family's here. Yeah, I mean, my life is really here. So I think that for me is important. So if, you, if you're asking like, what, what would I spend money on? It's just, I think that for me, just living in Los Angeles, it, you pay a premium for that. But I guess, I guess that's something I would spend money on. Yeah, yeah. cool. And um, my last question would be advice for people who want to start on YouTube in 2020. 
Uh, I would say you have to really like it. I think a lot of people started making YouTube videos because they see like, oh, I can make money from this. But they, you could, you could tell they're just, they're doing it just because they want to make money from it, and I think that shows. Like everyone who I've seen who does well on YouTube, like really enjoys it, and they have fun doing it, and you could tell. I think when someone doesn't enjoy what they're doing, you just, you get a sense of just like you feel sad, yeah. almost because you watch it, you're like. Oh. I feel down, but when someone's excited, it could be the most boring topic in the world, but if they're excited about it, you feel that excitement too. And it comes through on camera. So I would say like, first of all, you really have to want to do it. And then there's a strategy behind it. I mean, it is like playing a game of chess. So you can't just have fun making YouTube oh, yeah. videos. We have programs explaining that. Yeah, no, we have programs explaining that. You have to come at it from the perspective of, I think, a viewer. And that's something that I did is I watched so much YouTube and in the finance space, when I was watching, there's, there's nothing about personal finance on YouTube. So I was like, I want videos that would explain this and this and this, and no one else is doing it. There, was, there were probably like three people that were doing it, but there, there were just ways that I wanted it to be more polished and, and more like hypey instead of just, you know, sitting explaining something Boring, with a whiteboard. Yeah. I, wanted, I wanted something to be a little bit more immersive and just younger in a sense that more people would be able to relate to it. So I, I just, I made the content that I myself would watch and I think that's really important. Yeah, I think I started with the same thing. But now some people tell me, okay, but you started back in what, 2014, 2015. Now there are bloggers in every single niche. Mm -hmm. That might be, do you think it's harder these days? It's certainly harder because a lot more people are doing it, but I think there are definitely ways to stand out. Uh, and I still believe like going the financial independence route is still like, that's, not as touched on, I think, is just the, it, it's a little bit more boring, but it's it's more niche of just financial independence. And the CPM is so much early. higher. <laughs> What's up? The CPM is so much higher when you talk about finance. Yeah, I mean, finance investing CPM is is high. The highest, believe it, credit cards. It's oh, credit, credit cards, card really? Talking about credit, oh yeah. They'll, wow. pay, they'll pay a lot of money to, to be on your channel if you're talking about credit cards. Interesting, yeah. interesting. Before doing this video, would you go and research somebody else who did a, a top five, like, nerd wallet or whatever or you read it is probably one of my my biggest research tools is reading on reddit and just finding current offers and then to me i'll rank them based on what i think would be the best and what's the best value i certainly use resources like i mentioned the points guy a lot in my video and there's a few other uh, websites sources and blogs like that that i'll definitely reference in my videos but ultimately i, I never like just copying someone else's list because then it's like you're you're just copying their list. Yeah, like what's the yeah. So usually what I'll do is I'll take the best offers from everywhere and I'll compile like what I think would be the top five. Wow. Uh, especially for a beginner, like what would be the simplest cards to get and what which cards I have and that I like the most. Cool. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Guys, the one thing that you should learn from this interview is that you have to love what you do. That's yeah. I think that's the most important. Thank you so much, Graham. You're Thank welcome. you for the inspiration and for all the things that you teach us. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> Happy you. to be on. Oh, you gotta tell them to smash the like button for the YouTube algorithm. Yes, please. And subscribe to this channel. Thank you guys. See you soon. Bye.